Hello, this is the first flipped lecture of our second unit, and you should take notes on this material. This is all testable. <clears throat> first of all, on the next test, I've divvied up the section similar to the first test. There will be a list of men that we're going to go through and a list of women. There are other people we're going to talk about in different stories, Ehud and Jael and people like that, but these are the ones that I'm going to put on the test. So maybe pause the recording and take some time to write down these names with a couple of lines in between each one so that you have some space to write later on. Uh, we've already talked about Joshua. Joshua is the one who takes over from Moses. He was one of the two or one of the 12 scouts sent into the Promised Land when the Israelites were in the desert. And Joshua and Caleb did want to invade the Promised Land, and so they were allowed to come into the Promised Land. Moses goes up to Mount Nebo, looks over the Jordan River, and then he dies, and Joshua takes over. And Joshua's story begins the conquest of the Promised Land, the story of Jericho, where the Israelites take over the city, and then kill everybody inside of it and burn the place to the ground. So you should have a good handle on who he is. Gideon appeared in one of the readings that you did in the judge's assignment. If you have not done that assignment, make sure you do it so you can get up to speed. And the judge in ancient Israel had a twofold job. The job of the judge was to make sure the people were faithful to God, so they were religious leaders and they were also the military leaders. We see this in the story of Joshua. They bring the Israelites into the Promised Land, and immediately he goes up to Mount Gilgal and has the men make stone knives and circumcises everybody. And then after they're healed, they celebrate the Passover meal and enter the Promised Land and begin killing the Canaanites, which is a problem, and we've talked about that in class. If you were gone, please see me. The story of Gideon is similar. It begins with um, the people worshiping another god. And Gideon, in the middle of the night, goes and tears down that altar, actually built by his father. And this kind of rallies the Israelites to him. And after he's done that religious reform, then he takes his soldiers into battle against the Midianites and defeats them. So there's always the connection made between being faithful to God and being successful. The Israelites conquer Jericho, and then they go to attack the city of Ai, and they lose against Ai because somebody violated the, the ban and took some items for themselves. And that's why they lose the battle. So in each of the stories of the judges, the first job of the judge is to bring the Israelites back to God and then lead them to victory in battle. Uh, Gideon's name is actually changed to Jerubal because he tears down an altar to Baal. And the name Gideon is used by a group of people who put Bibles in hotel rooms. And in the story of Gideon, he overcomes a giant Midianite army with just a small group of soldiers. And so the Gideons take their names from him because they see themselves as accomplishing a great task with just a few people. And it seems in past years, right around the time that I cover the story of Gideon, the Gideons actually appear at Central Catholic High School and distribute little pocket Bibles to students. Um, and it just takes five people, one at each of the main entrances of the school and a couple at the main entrance and they can distribute Bibles to every single one of our students. If um, they approach you, be polite. If you want to accept a Bible, you may. It is not a complete Bible, and it's a different translation than we use in class, but you might find it handy to carry around. So there are also a couple of women we've talked about already. Um, the story of the conquest of Jericho is not complete without the story of Rahab. She is an innkeeper. Uh, some translations of the Bible place her as a prostitute, but probably somebody who ran a 
public house where a lot of illicit things took place. And in the story, Joshua sends some spies to Jericho, and Rahab has heard about the Israelites. She understands that God seems to be with them, and she decides to help the two spies. She ends up hiding the spies on her roof when the authorities come looking for them. And in exchange, the spies agree that when they take the city of Jericho, they will spare Rahab and her family. So even though she's a foreigner, she has allied herself with the Israelites and assisted them. And when it comes time for the Israelites to conquer Jericho, she hangs a scarlet ribbon out her window, and that is an indicator for the Israelites where she and her family live. And so when they conquer the town and slaughter everybody, men, women, children, old people, all the animals, they let Rahab and her family live. She's also going to appear a little bit later on when we do the genealogies in the New Testament. The other person who's appeared already as well is Deborah or Deborah, and she's noteworthy because there are several stories of judges. Samson is a judge, Ehud is a judge, um, Gideon is a judge, and Deborah is listed as one of the judges of ancient Israel. Uh, she's described as a prophetess. Her husband's name is given, but surprisingly for the Old Testament, she is not being measured by who her husband is or who her sons are. She herself is somebody who consults with God. When the Israelite general Barak is going out into battle, he consults with Deborah and asks Deborah to go with him into battle. She tells him that because he doesn't want to go by himself, then the glory of the mission will be earned by a woman, not by him. He's fine with that, and so when he goes out to fight the Canaanites, the enemy general runs away, and he runs to the tent of a Hebrew woman named Jael, and Jael invites him into the tent, gives him a bowl of warm milk, and he takes a nap, and then she kills him. So she becomes the um, hero of the story. But I just want to throw this out there, that ancient Israel did seem to have women who were in positions of religious authority. Um, Miriam was described as a prophetess, just as Deborah was. And Deborah also seemed to have some mil military power as well, since she was the one giving the orders to the general. The rest of the women and the men we will pick up as we continue through the Bible. So again, make sure you have these listed in your notes and some room to write when we get to them later on. Moving right along, I want to talk about the gods of the ancient Canaanites because we are going to encounter these names from time to time. Again, write them down, leave a little space in between them. The first to talk about is Baal. It's a two-syllable word with a glottal stop in the middle, sometimes pronounced Baal or Baal. Um, Baal is the chief god of the Canaanites. He was a thunder and lightning god like Zeus, a storm god whose reign brought fertility to the land. So he was the head of the Canaanite gods, and there are many, many mentions in the Bible of the Israelites worshiping Baal or what the Baal worshipers were doing. Uh, if you've taken a little bit of biology, you understand that a male fertility god can't fertilize things all by himself. His consort, his girlfriend, is Astarte, sometimes pronounced Ashtarte, or a variation of Ishtar. Some places in the Bible actually talk about the Asherahs, or the sacred poles, which were probably big phallic symbols outside of the temples to Astarte. And the Canaanite idea was that Baal and Astarte would go and fertilize your fields. They would go copulate on your fields, and then your sheep would reproduce in the spring, and your corn would grow in the spring, and your vegetables and your fruits would all be produced in abundance if you were to worship 
ball and Astarte properly. And one of the ways to do this was to go and pay a fee and to have sex with the temple prostitute. And since Baal and Astarte were not necessarily very clever, they would remember, oh my gosh, we're supposed to go over to the Johnson farm and make sure that they are fertile for next year as well. So those two names are going to come up several times um, over and over again over the next few weeks. The third name on the list, Molech, was a god, a war god, worshipped by one of the Canaanite groups. And as far as we can tell, worship of Molech actually involved the sacrifice of little children, specifically the sacrifice of boys. And if you really wanted to show Molech how dedicated you were, you would sacrifice your own son. You would sacrifice even a firstborn son to Molech. And then Moloch would bring you a victory in battle. That was kind of the deal that he had with you. And Moloch is mentioned from time to time in the Bible, um, that there were people worshiping uh, Moloch or even Israelites, uh, immolating their children or sacrificing their children by fire to Moloch. And so I want you to know that. Uh, Dagon is the Philistines' god, and the Philistines had moved into Palestine or into Canaan from the sea. They were probably Phoenician-related. And Dagon was a, originally a sea god, later became their grain god. And I'm just going to pull up a quick little picture of Dagon. In some depictions, he is seen as half man, half fish. And if you do the extra credit assignment on Eli, there's kind of an interesting little thing that happens to the statue of Dagon, and I've got my own little theory about what that is. Uh, the last, the next one, Baal Zebub, I don't think I'm going to put on the test. Um, that name is found elsewhere in the Bible as a Baal. The word Baal means Lord, the Lord of the Flies, the Baal of the Zebubs. And that becomes, in other places, a name for the devil or Satan, the Lord of the Flies. Um, but it has that root ball. Of course, the Israelites worship Yahweh. They worship um, a god that they are supposed to obey. Um, they can't even say God's name. They have to substitute Adonai. I'm going to transition real quick. Here's a little picture of Ishtar and a picture of Baal. No pictures on the test. But I want to talk briefly about worldviews and how the Israelites viewed God versus how the Canaanites viewed God. And in the Israelite idea of God, there is one God up in heaven who's in charge of everything, a God who made everything. This is a God who judges us if we've done well and rewards us, and who punishes us if we've done wrong. We see this in the story of Noah. And it is our job to obey God. It's our job to understand what God's commandments are and to follow those. And that's the opposite of what the Canaanites, or really any polytheistic um, ancient religion thought. The Canaanites had a worldview in which there were many gods up in the heavens, each of them in charge of controlling one facet of creation. So a grain god, or a wind god, or a rain god, or a volcano god. Those gods were often in conflict with each other. Nobody was in charge of anything. Zeus couldn't go down to the bottom of the ocean to pick up a lobster for dinner unless he got permission from Poseidon. And sometimes the gods would fight against each other. The uh, wind god might tear down the crops put up by a grain god, or a volcano god might spill lava onto a village and then into the sea where he was defeated by a life or a, a sea god. And there was a sense in which stuff just kind of happened and nobody was really in control. But the Canaanites and other polytheistic people thought we could control the gods. We could do certain rituals, and the gods will do what we want. Which helps explain the ban, why the Israelites wanted to kill off the Canaanites 
and their worldview.